Go home, Amityville, you're drunk. What started as a horror drama looking for prestige has ended up being a bit of a joke franchise that anyone wanting to have some sort of cachet attached to it just slaps the Amityville name onto it. There are nearly 30, that I care to look for anyway, that have Amityville in the title. And while about two thirds of them are a complete waste of time, there's a lot to find enjoyment out of otherwise. The first movie from 1979 was based on the best-selling book written by Jay Anson that took the nation by storm. Adapted by Sandor Stern, who was mostly a journeyman TV writer, who also wrote the made-for-TV Amityville movie in 89, and directed by Cool Hand Luke director Stuart Rosenberg, the first film adaptation would do quite well. It would make $86 million on a sub-$5 million budget and garner an Academy Award nomination for Best Original Score. The cast would include father of Thanos James Brolin, Margot Kidder and Rod Steiger, among others, and the reviews would be mixed, but of course studios never let things like reviews get in the way of making money on sequels. The first two came pretty quickly after in 1982 and 83, and follow about what you expect from a horror series. Amityville 2 The Possession is a prequel that follows the famous DeFeo murders, but changes their last name. Amityville 3D is the obligatory 3D entry into the series that most of the heavy hitters would also follow. After that, we got a made-for-TV movie that didn't do too well, followed by four straight direct-to-video ones that actually all have things going for them, and often follow cursed objects like a clock, a mirror, or a dollhouse. But more on those in a minute. We would get a remake in 2005, a sequel of sorts that follows the new way of ignoring everything else in 2017, and the absolute insanity of mockbusters. If you remember the good old days of Blockbuster, you could go in and rent things, things that actually exist, mind you, like Transmorphers and Aliens vs. Avatars. Yep. Go watch them, but don't blame me after. What this would get you is a whole mess of ridiculous concept films that would have Amityville in the title to make viewers go, oh yeah, Amityville, that super famous, super scary real story and movie. Then they would pop in absolute trash like Amityville in Space, Amityville Moon, and Amityville Karen. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. If you want to go down the full rabbit hole, go type in Amityville into IMDb. I dare you. Honestly though, the first eight movies, minus the made-for-TV one, all have things to offer in their own ways and are worth seeking out. Today I want to showcase one of the four mid-90s ones that doesn't get much love. They all float in and out of being available on Tubi, but were also given the Blu-ray treatment by purveyors of trash vinegar syndrome. God bless them. Amityville 1992, It's About Time, or just Amityville, It's About Time, is the second of these, and I think one of the best that deserves further discovery. Like all of these first eight movies, they have some fun actors show up. You get Burt Young in part two, Meg Ryan and that criminal mastermind Lori Laughlin in part three, Kim Coates in Amityville Curse, and an absolute stacked cast in New Generation with David Naughton, Richard Roundtree, Terry O'Quinn, and Lynn Shea. Don't sleep on today's cast, though, with an appearance by the late great Dick Miller and led by our favorite main accent ever, Stephen Mocked. I'm somewhat embarrassed to admit that I used to get Mocked confused with Fred Ward, but the more time I spend shouting out these forgotten horror movies, the more I realize what Mocked offers. The movie opens with our lead character Jacob, played by Mocked, coming home from Amityville after they wanted him to be the lead architect on a new build community project. He's brought home with him an antique clock that was recovered from a torn down house. Guess which one? Came from one of those houses we tore down for the development. Dad to his own home. His wife has passed away, and his former girlfriend Andrea is staying at the house to help watch his two teenage children, Rusty and Lisa. The clock burrows its way into the fireplace, and Rusty has a strange hallucination when he flicks the light switch. The living room switches back and forth between their modern digs and a colonial torture chamber. You gotta be fucking kidding me. While out running, Jacob is attacked by the neighbor dog Peaches, and only survives by stabbing the dog in the face with a broken bottle. He's sent home from the hospital under Andrea's care, while Rusty, who skips school, seeks advice from the creepy old neighbor who happens to dabble in the occult. The effects in this movie are one of its standouts. Jacob's leg continues to get worse and worse, and it's honestly wince-inducing at points with its blood and pus taking over the wound and mocked really selling the pain with every step. The effects were done by Peter Curran, who honestly has one of the most impressive resumes I've ever seen. He worked on everything from Star Wars to Robocop, Starship Troopers to Nightbreed. He has 88 credits and is still working today while being an unsung hero to genre fans everywhere. Another strange occurrence happens when Rusty is walking and talking during dinner, and upon entering the living room, he loses all time. 
It's a really cool transition done using zero special effects. Rusty is played by Damon Martin, and this would be his final acting role. Fans of this channel have almost certainly seen him in Ghoulies 2, Pee-wee's Big Adventure, and an episode of Freddy's Nightmares. He would open his own production company and produce a little over a dozen films, including the remake of Night of the Demons. Lisa and Andrea have some girl talk, and the clock locks Lisa in a room while also attacking Andrea via a black blob that was fresh off its appearance in Creepshow 2. Peaches the dog, who never actually attacked Jacob, is found in the pool cleaner. I guess disposed of by the spirit of the clock? The police interview Rusty for some graffiti that ends up on a neighbor's garage, and Andrea invites her boyfriend over to the house in a really bold move. Her boyfriend is a psychologist named Lenny and is hateable from the first scene. He comes off as sort of a great value version of Ellis from Die Hard. He awkwardly meets the family, and the two have dinner while he accuses Andrea of getting tricked by the family to stay. A fire breaks out, and the neighbor, a blink-and-you-miss-it Dick Miller, assumes Rusty is the culprit. Lenny decides to have a midnight snack and is stalked by the seemingly cleaned up and no longer injured Jacob, who interviews him in at first a genial way that quickly turns dark. Take a look at this puppy. This is Stephen Mock's scene. He gets some great over-the-top evil near the end when he's fully possessed, but this is serial killer levels of unhinged. Of course, we know Mocked from Night Shift, but for an entire generation, he's better known as the dad from Monster Squad. It's one of my favorite 1980s flicks, and is a cornerstone of the Fred Decker duology, along with Night of the Creeps. Lenny realizes it was some sort of episode, and is rightfully freaked out when the house goes after Lisa next. Lisa is played by Megan Ward, who is mainly known for nearly 400 episodes of General Hospital. But right after this film, she would reprise her role from Transfers 2 and Transfers 3 with her on-screen dad, Stephen Mock. We really have to get into more Charles Band shenanigans on this show. The same goo comes back, and if you remember, this is the goo that also appeared in the series as far back as the first film. Yay for continuity! The next morning, Rusty tries to explain his neighbor's thoughts on evil, and Lisa has become evil Lisa overnight. The neighbor, Mrs. Wheeler, figures it all out, and when she goes to do something about it, the evil presence in the clock kills her with a Rube Goldberg-like series of events. The ground takes hold of her cane, and her runaway van knocks her to the ground while also forcing a giant ornament to stab and kill her. The scene is dumb, but also fun, and a good use of the limited special effects budget. Wheeler is played by Golden Age actress Nita Talbot, who has 152 credits to her name, ranging from westerns, to Elvis movies, to western Elvis movies, and all the way to 90s Spider-Man cartoons. She say bargaining with Doc Ock? I don't want to discuss it. Certainly not in front of him. Rusty gets arrested, and evil Lisa kills her date before Lenny and Andrea knock out a fully overboard Jacob. The house finally drives Lenny crazy. Uh, Lenny, what's wrong? and Andrea finds a doll of him hanging on the model homes, only to discover that life imitates art. Lenny is played by Jonathan Penner, who is actually an Oscar nominee for a documentary short. He was the secondary main character to Taya Leone in one of her many 90s shows, but also appeared in fun genre work, including the recent Bye Bye Man. Andrea and Rusty are tired of the crap, and the movie has the guts to let Rusty kill his sister, while Andrea has an all-out brawl with Jacob. Andrea is a great final girl character, and she isn't a dumb protagonist either. Sean Weatherly plays her as capable and compassionate, and her career was short but fun like most of the cast. This is her only horror credit, and that's a shame, but you can find her in Police Academy 3 and a medium stint on Baywatch, which, you know, after seeing her, not that surprising. Andrea takes out Jacob and then turns her eyes on the clock. Destroying it sends everyone back in time to when Jacob returned from his trip, and only Andrea is aware of the future events. She destroys the clock immediately and utters the title line like a badass before leaving. What the hell was that all about? It's about time, that's what.
Amityville It's About Time was just a stop on the road for the actors and crew, but it's a fun one. Director Tony Randall, no not that one, is slightly better known as the director of Hellraiser 2 and Ticks, but he also directed a segment of Joe Bob's Drive-In, so he's definitely our kind of guy. Writer Chris DeFeria only has this in the immediate Amityville sequel, but he went on to be a mega producer for things like Mad Max Fury Road and Gravity. This movie isn't going to change anyone's life, but it delivers on everything you could want in a 90s direct-to-video horror sequel. Just because a series has a bunch of sequels it doesn't need doesn't mean they are all bad. Go out of your comfort zone and explore the movies nobody thinks about. Like I said, this movie is just a small step in these people's careers, so take a small step on your horror journey and give it the 95 minutes it deserves. It's about time you did. Ah! 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 Ah!